yes, we're looking at the fight against corruption, uh, where we are in terms of uh, illicit financial flows, and of course, ICP. ICPC review uh, findings in the system study review. We have with us this morning, as a slide already showed there, Professor Bolaji Owasoye, who is the chairman of the Independent Corrupt Practices Commission. You're welcome to Sunrise Daily this morning. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's been a very busy time, it will seem, at the ICPC. Uh, this year alone, we have heard quite a number of reports that you have released. Uh, first was with the National Assembly, your study, I think your, you had a partnership of some sort, uh, doing um, a look into their constituency allowances and how it's been spent. They did not find that funny. They're threatening to sue. I don't know how far they've... Are you in court already? No, no, no. They didn't threaten to sue. They were asked for some questions and clarifications which were given them. And by the way, the National Assembly is not opposed to this project. Okay. Uh, of course, there are people who will feel uncomfortable about whatever measures that are taken. But by and large, the National Assembly is actually very supportive. Indeed, we have members of the National Assembly requesting our assistance to ensure that their constituency projects are done. So contrary to whatever is out there in the airwaves and uh, some of the hot debates... That even if seen, it was put out there by members of the, of the National Assembly themselves? Even, even if it was put out there. Uh, last week we were in Ibadan. We were having a retreat with the National Assembly members of the Oversight Committee on our commission, both from the uh, Senate and the House of Rep. And it was a very robust engagement about how best we could work together towards diminishing corruption, looking at what they are doing, the bills that they want to prioritize, uh, looking at what we are doing, how they can support us, and stuff like that. It's interesting because we, we still heard the speaker uh, saying that um, they, they were not given fair hearing in that report, that their own side of the conversation wasn't taken on before the report was eventually okay, so, published. So that was last year. Yes, it so was. So you don't want to stay in the past. Things have moved since then. Okay, that was last year when we published that report which showed from our pilot survey of selected constituency projects across the entire country what we found. Mm -hmm. Of course, the findings made some people uncomfortable. Uh, we've seen clarify quite a number of things and all that. So between last year and now, we're not where we were before. In, so they become quite supportive, and so there will be no I, court I summons. Think that, you don't I, I think, think that there will be any court summons anymore. If, if there is a court summons, fine. We'll face it when we get to We'll cross the bridge when we get there, but there's no court summons. Okay. There's no question. Um, so where are we now? Because I know that you are a big advocate. And before you even became uh, the chairman of the ICPC, you had spoken very strongly on how we had to check illicit financial flows into this country. And it's a big problem because people also talk about the current insecurity challenges we face and how these financial flows go to fund this uh, pr pro well, should we say, this purchases, so to speak. Where are we in being able to track this financial flows? Yeah. Uh, and have we been able to make any major breakthroughs uh, in that regard? Okay. Now, the, the whole issue around illicit financial flows is actually about money that we need in our country mm -hmm. going out illegally. It's not more about money coming in. It's more actually about money going out illicitly and illegally. Now, the whole concept of illicit financial flows, uh, there's a huge debate between developed and developing countries. Developing countries are the ones who lose capital, and I'll explain the ways by which we lose money. We lose money from commercial transactions, uh, especially from tax evasion, from money being uh, moved out by the falsification of trade records. So, for example, Channels, as a company, wants to import cameras, and somebody overprices the cost of the cameras, you have to pay. You have to wire money to wherever you are buying from. If the price is inflated, you have sent out more money that this country could have used in some other areas. In other words, some other customer. You've had to put down more Naira to get the dollar value or whatever currency in order to import your cameras. Okay, so that's where we buy mo which money goes at. On the other hand, if you want to export, let's say, channels where you have a product like your tablet and you need to export it, and government says, how many are you exporting? And you say it is 100. But you, in fact, exported 
500. Now, when you export 100, we expect you to bring back the proceeds for 100. Okay, but then you exported 500. You keep 400 out there. You've lied to government. So this whole issue about illicit financial flows is about money leaving the economy. It makes the country struggle for capital that otherwise would have been retained here. The biggest part of it is actually tax evasion and profit shifting. When companies do business in our economy, for example, and they create problems, let's say environmental challenges, let's say they release effluents and all that, when they falsify their records and they say they have earned less or they have made more money, less money than they actually made, it means they pay less tax. Because corporate tax is about 30%. So if the turnover of channels this year is $1 billion, and you guys say it is $500 million, you pay tax on $500 million. And then you have moved $500 million out either by over-invoicing some of your transactions, uh, by paying Malpay and some other friends of yours in Lagos much more money than actually the agreement, you know, the paper trail will show that your salary was a million dollars, whereas in actual fact it is less. Or they give you allowances that are opaque. So at the end of the day, the company says that its turnover and its uh, running cost is higher than what it is. So it under declares its profit. It means FRS will get less in terms of tax. Or the company says, oh, I'm not a Nigerian company. I was registered in Mauritius. I was registered in Cayman Islands. I was registered in so-so-so place. So my tax liability is far lower than this. So a lot of money goes out through commercial transactions that appear legal on the face of it. Now tax is public money. It's the revenue that you and I need to build roads, hospitals, and all that. So when companies falsify records, it's against the law. It's criminal, OK? So that's one way by which money moves out. There are other ways by which money moves out, whereby you engage consultants, mm -hmm. okay, and you overprice their fee, or you develop products. Some companies develop IT products, which are developed by Nigerian experts. But then they will come up with some funny agreement that says, oh, we retained the expert from so-so-so place. We have to pay the expert this much money. So they ship out money. They apply to CBN. They move out money, money that should have stayed there, okay? Or they say we've borrowed money from abroad and the interest rate is this much. That means once the company is doing business and it is making profit, it has to first of all pay its debtors before shareholders will take any money. Okay? So that's the way it works. So illicit financial flows is about money that should stay here for development, economic development of our country going out. Now, mind you, with a company, if it's a manufacturing company that is located in Abuja, all of the environmental effects of what it does are here. But you have moved the money that helps us to ameliorate whatever those negative consequences are. Say, for example, you release toxins into our waterways that need to be cleaned up. We're all talking about global warming and other issues. So the country needs to deal with that. And there are responsibilities that belong to government, which can only meet by tax uh, revenue. So if you undermine the capacity of the government to do it because you're taking all the money out, how would the government meet that obligation, you know? So it's virtually impossible. So the question is, uh, have you been able to make any major breakthrough? Given oh, yeah, okay, know? fine. So the first thing is to put some clarity into the whole thing. That's why many people don't understand IFFs. So ICPC is secretariat to the interagency committee that looks at uh, illicit financial flows. And what we do, is, and the agencies are customs, FRS, ourselves, EFCC, Justice, NATI, okay, uh, FIU, uh, Corporate Affairs Commission, all the agencies that have anything to do. Because from what I've described, you see that the company, who are the people behind it, is important. What sort of business they are doing is important. When they want to ship things, bring things into the country, or export is important, customs is involved. So everybody, are, everybody is taking measures mm -hmm. to make sure that we reduce the opportunities for this to happen so that we can increase our own revenue. If you look at this year's budget, for example, government is placing a lot of hope on FRS to bring in about $5 trillion of the revenue or more that is expected to run the budget for 2020. 
Now, if FRS capacity is undermined because people are falsifying records, it won't meet that standard or customs because people falsify trade records. So you import a container load of goods, which is, which is uh, filled up with iPads. You change it from iPad to something else. Because if you declare iPads, this is the duty that you pay. So you put something else that is lower duty. And custom checks of the import is manual, which is, of course, impossible. How many containers are, you going, are human beings going to climb and enter? And you go into a 40-feet container and see what is at the back. So all over the world, people use scanners, not this manual thing. So there are many things that are done to facilitate this falsification of trade records, which consequently undermines government's capacity to raise revenue. So we are looking very closely at, at all of this, and measures are being taken and introduced to ensure that trade facilitation, everything goes seamlessly in order that Nigeria ends its revenue. You recall that just a few weeks ago, we had this new collaboration with Pebec on the ease of doing business. Mm -hmm. Everything is linked together for ICPC to play a role in ensuring that public revenue stays where it is and it belongs. Mm. Well, you have also been, uh, you've already said you're the secretary, I think you're helping to coordinate yeah. you know, all of these activities. What I'm asking is whether or not we have been able to see any companies that you know, are in violation of... Oh, there of are always this. companies in violation. I'm not going to be giving you names of companies on TV. There are always companies in violation and FRS goes after them. So. Is a whole combination. When you have an interagency team and everybody plays his role, what people are trying to hide, mm -hmm. you then discover it. And then, of course, you go after them with whatever the rules are, and you make them pay what they're supposed to pay. So it happens all the time, mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. Let tell us about this system study review. We understand that you have been uh, trying to prevent corruption even before it happens, and you're looking at how government agencies are, you know, efficient in terms of how they uh, distribute the scarce revenue or the scarce resources that we have in such a way that everybody is able to get an even hand. Uh, I hope I'm getting this correctly, uh, or even access. Maybe maybe not equal access, but an even access uh, to the resources that you know government has. Mm -hmm. Um, how, is, how has it gone so far? Because I understand it's just in the federal capital territory that you've been able to conduct some of uh, this system of study review, but you hope to take it to the state. Okay. But where, where are you with that? Okay, well, basically, first of all, when corruption is systemic, you cannot fight it successfully by enforcement measures alone. It's not possible because the agencies that you need to enforce are already compromised. Whether it's a prosecuting agency, whether it's judicial systems, whether those you need evidence from, everybody is compromised. So, but once there is a political will to deal with it, then you need to a combination of efforts, both enforcement, prevention, especially leveraging on technology, which is what we are doing. So basically the system study review, it looks at a system a whole institution, for example, say channels, if you are a public institution, we look at what's your revenue profile, and then we look at what you should be remitting to government. We look at what's your staff strength. If you say your staff strength is 100, and we find that that salaries are paid to everybody and there's money left, we have to ask you, where is this extra coming from? Because government is the one paying your salary. If everybody has been paid and nobody is saying they have not been paid, and we still see almost 50% of whatever is your salary budget left there, you have questions to answer. That's, what, that's where ghost workers come from and, and padding comes from. So what ICPC did, and it went beyond the federal capital territory in the sense that we looked at federal agencies only, both within Abuja and in other parts of the country. Uh, for example, we looked at academic institutions. We looked at some medical institutions and all that. And basically what we found was quite a bit of padding, especially of personnel. Okay, in some institutions. And we made this report public um, to say that people have been paid salaries, we come in at a particular month, and we find a lot of money still left there, supposedly for payroll. So what we did was to immediately sequester those funds by saying you cannot spend it anymore. If everybody has been paid their salary, nobody is saying I've not been paid for this month, and you have this much money. It means you have falsified the records you presented to government about your payroll. So that's what part of the system story, especially then we look at capital. So when the National Assembly appropriates and the law is passed, it is specific about what you can spend money for. So when you then spend the money for things not approved, okay, then that's wrong. Or we find that you spend, you pay fees from capital, okay? You do, you pay recurrent items from capital. We know it means that you have padded or you falsify your capital budget. 
All of these are the things that cost government money or lead to funds diversion into areas where money is not required. And we cannot build roads. Government cannot build bridges. Because government uh, prioritizes payroll. Government wants to pay everybody. Every month, they want to pay everybody first. And then the rest of the money. And that's why you always find in the budget, people complain that 70% of the budget is for recurrent expenditure. Only 30% is left for capital. capital development. And without capital development, you can't create jobs. So it's because there's still budget padding. There's misallocation of resources. So what our system study does, as I said, we are a bit strategic in what we're doing, is to look at what you asked for, what you used it for, to show that you actually misapplied and to indicate that you actually got money you didn't require. By doing that, there's an opportunity cost because every cobalt that you got that you didn't need, somebody else could not get that actually needed it, especially a capital project. So that's the logic of it. So what we're trying to do now is to cascade this down to subnational level based on our own capacity and budget. We're doing a lot more at the federal, which makes a lot of sense. We're a federal agency. We're funded by the federal. So first of all, we need to help assist. So last year, for example, we were able to help government restrain about 45 billion from this system study on federal agencies alone, on federal agencies alone, different agencies. And we published this in the report which we released last year. Let's quickly go to Lagos and take questions from my colleagues. Gentlemen. Well, yes, Prof. If I could just follow up on uh, your point about illicit financial flow. We do know that in some climes, they do have processes and mechanisms of valuation inclusive so that they check goods, services, products, property, whatever it is that people are dealing with such that it stays within that threshold so people don't profiteer from all of those things. But here, we don't have all of those things. So isn't that going to be a lot more difficult for us to do our jobs, including your commission? It is already very difficult. I gave one example, uh, which is with, for example, when you import goods, you fill a form that says this is what is in the container that I'm bringing into the country. The customs who have a duty, who are the gatekeepers at the ports, have a duty to confirm what you have declared. Oftentimes, now, globally, any economy that is very serious, you cannot manually verify what is contained in those containers. The, there are scanners. I mean, can you imagine you traveling abroad and you are going through the airport and your bags, the bags of all passengers coming into the country or living, has to be checked manually. First of all, the queue, the risks, and the absurdity of the whole thing. So you're right, we need technology. And I'm aware that the government is working very hard. They had a scanner there before that I learned uh, got damaged. So efforts are ongoing to make sure that we use technology. That's just one aspect of the challenge. There are other components of it. So in today's world, technology has helped to make things easy. And that's what Nigeria really needs to do. And in fairness, government is making a lot of effort to improve this, both the customs, the Ministry of Finance, CBN, we are aware, because they are all part of the interagency committee that I talked about. So it would seem you're trying to focus attention uh, on subnational levels also. And I, recently you said that you know, impunity also takes place across local and state government. And I'd like to know, what did you find out? Because when you say more, do you mean in terms of volume, in terms of the amount itself, or in terms of the cases? What did you find out at the subnational levels? Okay, so fine. It's not as if we've done a survey. I mean, but from my work both as an academic and uh, before getting into government, I already know, and I think this is pretty clear too, there's a lot more impunity at the subnational level. I'll just give you an example. The budget at the federal level is discussed and robustly debated, is it not? So the National Assembly very rigorously and vigorously reviews the budget. At which state level do you see state governments or state legislature vigorously, rigorously, debating a budget that a governor. In some places, we saw one governor <laughs> in the past who came to the State House of Assembly, you know, uh, to come and tell them that this is what I gave you people, just do it now while I'm here. And they just ratified the whole thing, okay? So you find that the subnational level is very weak because of the nature of our politics. Then look at local government level. I mean, there's a lot being said about local governments, how states hijack their revenue and already 
FIU, the government is already trying to deal with that. But local government also has internally generated revenue. Nobody asks them about it. They generate revenue. Your radio and TV license, those market stalls, cart pushers, local government takes money from them. Some permits, okay? Have you ever heard any local government disclosing that this is uh, my budget for the year, this is uh, the revenue I hope to make from IGR and all that? They don't do that. They just collect the money. They don't account to anybody. Just do what they like. So basically, and everything that you find happening at the federal level in terms of corruption of any type happens in a far worse manner with a higher level of impunity at the state and local government. And nobody challenges anything because uh, people who operate there are very imperial. In fact, the federal government is far much better. But there's a lot more attention to the federal government because it has a bigger chunk of revenue allocation. So everybody looks towards the local government, the federal government. So even when states are misbehaving and not accounting for the budget and the money that they have, and their citizens complain, they point their fingers towards Abuja to say, oh, it's because we don't have enough money from the federal government and all that. That is not to say that the revenue allocation formula does not need review. But what I'm trying to say is that there is enough evidence, factual, that there's a higher level of impunity at the subnational level. So basically what ICPC is trying to do, based, as I keep repeating, on our own capacity, human capital, and our funding, to begin to look at ways by which we can support, okay, and do some system study reviews. I will admit, for example, that some states do invite and ask for help, okay, to look at particular areas of challenges which we are happy to do. But strategically, our law does not prevent us from looking beyond the national level. So we're going to, in the coming uh, months, look at sub-national sub level. Now, you, you uh, mentioned the federal government as the um, biggest spender of all the various uh, uh, levels of uh, government. And of course, perhaps that's, as you said, is why many people give attention to the federal government. The Auditor General, for instance, also gives attention to the federal government ministries, departments and agencies. And it will seem like successively, the Auditor General's report indicts many ministries, departments and agencies uh, from the report that they're sending um, every year. And uh, many wonder if it's an operational, doc uh, it's an operable document for the ICPC to follow up on um, the processes of some of these ministries, departments, and agencies. We're already doing that through the system study review. Sometimes when you are doing a system study review, uh, which is to look at the cultural practices of an agency, you find an enforcement measure that you can follow, and we actually do that, is that we don't make too much noise about it. So, for example, you are looking at how uh, personnel and capital funding was applied in a particular fiscal year, and you discover that certain monies have moved into the accounts of certain officers of the agency, okay? Then, which is contrary to, to the regulations, then you have to call them to explain what happened and if they can't explain, we recover the money, and in some cases, we prosecute them, okay? So that is already going on. And I should say that the, the Auditor General's office and ourselves are actually on a collaboration, which is going to be announced also publicly in the coming days, um, working much more robustly. As I said, given the kind of systemic corruption that we're dealing with, it's impossible to deal with it by enforcement measures alone. In any event, it's like crying over spilled milk. The money is gone. It's been wrongfully spared. You cannot recover the money. You can punish the perpetrators, yes, okay, but it does not give you the money that you need in the immediate. So part of the strategy we're focusing on now is how to stop it, at least to reduce the opportunities for this to happen, to focus on things and for the MDAs and those that we're looking at to know that we're going to be looking at those things. And that is already having a positive multiplier effect. Mm. Let's go on break at this point. When we come back, we'll continue the conversation. Please stay with us. 
Professor Balaji Owasongi is still with us in our studios. He's the chairman of ICPC, that's the Independent Corrupt Practices Commission. And we're talking about the work that they've done so far. Just before we went on break, he was shedding a lot of light on the study system, system study review rather, and talking about how um, in the States there is greater impunity. Uh, there are those who will argue, uh, and we've seen this happen with the EFCC, uh, assuming you were to go to a state where you were not invited because you have said some states do invite you uh, they will argue that you do not have jurisdiction over them uh, what would you say in states like that well actually we face those difficulties as well mm -hmm. they're not right uh, but some of those things have to be judicially determined it has to climb its way all the way to the to the Supreme Court uh, you uh, as you may recall when the ICPC act was passed itself some states challenged it and said that the federal government under President Obasanjo at that time did not have the power to legislate on corruption. And the case stalled the takeoff of the ICPC for like two years. That is interesting. That though. case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court held that the federal government had power to legislate, and that that law would bind the states. So some of the funny decisions that we are getting at some state levels, saying that EFCC, ICPC do not have the power, they are contrary to this existing Supreme Court decision. So, but we are under a rule of law. So some of those cases have to be challenged all the way to the top. But like I said, there are many enforcement measures that we've taken at state level and successfully for that matter. Such as? So, for example, we've prosecuted public servants at the state level who work for the state. We've investigated corruption at the state level in a number of states, you know, across the country, both EFCC and ICPC. Uh, so we have cases involving uh, staff of, and they are not saying we cannot prosecute them. It is when some big fish are involved and they want to stall the prosecution, they go and start challenging and say, oh, it's a matter that is settled. And they always have lawyers, as we've seen in recent times. They would always find lawyers who would take forward some of these things. And regrettably, sometimes find judges who, contrary to existing decisions of the Supreme Court, will say, oh, yes, it's true. They cannot look at so, 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 and so. But ultimately, those decisions get overturned. You know, what is achieved is to stall the investigation. They want to buy time, to stall it, maybe to coerce witnesses for evidence to disappear and all that. So they need a break. Okay, that's what those things are meant for, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So how do you then, well, you have said that you usually you follow through with the judicial process, uh, but so far so good. For the states who do ask for help, what areas are they really seeking help for? Okay, for don't forget that states also need revenue stability. Mm -hmm. So for example, some states are setting up their own anti-corruption commission, which is a welcome development, okay? Uh, Cano State has its own anti-corruption commission, or your state recently, under the current government, passed and established an anti-corruption commission. And when we went to open our Oyo State office, the media asked me whether or not I thought this would not be conflictual. I said, no, it cannot be. Because the state is also interested in dealing with the issues that are affecting it. The state suffer corruption. So if we are a federal agency funded by the federal government, you can invite me to help you and all that. If I don't have the capital or the human capital or the resource to do so, I may not respond the way you want. But if you are really honestly determined to deal with corruption in your own state, you can set up a commission to help you out. So I find it highly complimentary and it is to be encouraged across the country. Because when you are dealing with systemic corruption, one agency cannot do it. It's simply impossible. So we find it very uh, uh, welcoming that some states take the initiative to set up their own anti-corruption commission. They would also look at, we can collaborate together. When we met with the state government, we said, we are happy to collaborate with you because working together, we get it right and do it better than working alone. So if, for example, we are investigating at the state level, the state can make things difficult unless maybe we arrest them and, and use our, the, our enforcement powers to get documents. You need those documentation to validate and investigate. They can start giving you excuses and all that. But when you are working together, everything you ask for in order to prove or disprove an allegation will be handed over to you just in a seamless manner. As we wrap up, I just want to ask you, even though largely we haven't heard uh, that the ICPC has come under any pressure, have you had any political interference? <laughs> this curious. is the current question that everybody asks. What sort of political interference are you looking for? Uh -huh. Go on, break it down for me. <laughs> Well, you certainly know the sort of political <laughs> interference I'm referring to, and the sort of political interference that Largely, you know, government... I'm going to be honest with you. Yes. The president, which is the person that everybody looks for, has never once interfered. 
in the things that we do. By law, we're independent. And that independence is to the decision we take about operational issues, enforcement and all that. It's not independence about the number of staff that I have, for example. Because the government pays them. So I can't go out there and say, I want to employ 2 million people. The government will ask you, how are you going to pay them? Mm. Okay, do you have the money? So there is, I mean, subtle pressures. In fact, most of the pressure comes from the media. Not from government, yes. From the media to drop cases? No, no, no. From the media to drift in their own direction or they want to second guess what you're doing. Interesting. Very. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we certainly know it's not from our own media house. <laughs> your media um, house. <laughs> we have to thank you for coming on Sunrise City this morning. <laughs> Professor Balaji Owasongi is the chairman of the Independent Corrupt Practices Commission. Sunrise City continues about now with the crew in Lagos. Gentlemen.